Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Today, we have a special edition of Summer Solutions, in which we talk about possible solutions to what ails the world. In this episode, we're going to talk about the problem with money. Many, for example, now agree that having bankers print over 90% of money by issuing loans is a problem. They also see that the euro currency is a problem for nations like Greece. We're going to talk about all of this. So let's talk and turn to Alistair McLeod. Alistair, welcome back to the show. Shall we say you are from BitGold now or BitGold Gold Money? How did I think keep it gold money because BitGold will change their name to gold money. Is that a fact? Yep. Huh. Oh, we got some breaking news here on the show. <laughs> so BitGold is going to take the gold money name. Okay, well, when, we, when it happens, I don't know. We can mention go happen. into BitGold a little bit later on. But first, let's talk summer solutions. Stacy. Well, you are a big champion of the, a gold standard, and uh, we want to ask you what the gold standard would offer as a solution to the global monetary policies that we see around us. In particular, like wh which ones in particular, wh what issues could be addressed? The global imbalances that we see there have been causing repeated boom and bust and disasters and economic chaos. How would it help? It would address all the issues that arise because of unsound money. It's actually as simple as that. And what is that, That's, unsound money? Well, unsound money basically is money that can be printed at will or expanded at will, which is what the banks do with bank credit. They expand it at will, and as Max said earlier, um, up to 90%, in fact, more than 90% of money in circulation is bank credit. And, of course, that accumulates over a period of time into bank debt. And it's that debt. We have become an, um, a society of the, really virtually every economy now works on the basis of debt. So when you look at something that represents wealth, think not just about what you're looking at, whether it's a nice building or, or a brand new car or something like that, but think about the debt that has financed it. It is all debt. The real worth, uh, wealth, if you like, in the economy, in all our economies, is actually considerably less than we think because it has been, if you like, spent away in the form of debt. Well, in, in the uh, classical gold standard, the notion of savings was still part of the everyday reality of people participating in the economy. We live in a world now with, dominated by fiat currencies, and the word savings has become a dirty word. Uh, the global central bankers and bankers want people to be only consumers, and they don't want anyone to save money because they, why save money? We, don't, we can just print it into existence. You, we don't need your, you to be savings. We don't need your wages, even. That's what they say. But the fact of the matter is that the way people work is they produce things in order to consume. Now, most of that consumption is immediate But no, we're in a li we, they borrow to consume. Well, they don't produce anything in this well, country. Know, you know, that's what's happening now. But it's worse than that because, uh, you know, normally what should happen is that you produce something in order to consume. And some of your consumption, your surplus consumption, you put off in the form of savings for later. Because money, after all, is stored uh, labor, if you like. That's probably the best way to, to, to look at it is in terms of its role. Now, if you devalue that stored labor, then you really are monkeying around with the markets um, in a very, very big fashion and making it very difficult for people to operate with any certainty within the markets. Yeah, but how are we going to convince people that they, in order to realign the global economy, they're going to have to stop their role as real estate speculators in this country, extracting wealth from overpriced properties and get real jobs and manufacturing stuff. Borrowing from the banks in order to gear it up and all the rest of it. Well, yeah, because in the UK, yeah. the average house in London earns 80,000 pounds a year. Mm -hmm. If you had to replace that with an actual job, wouldn't you rather yeah. just sit in your home and like drink tea and, and let you, the house do the work for you? Have you? A, you, have a world, you have a country of rent yeah. TAs here in the UK. Uh, there's well, no workers you, here. You, you certainly... You <laughs> No, there are workers. No, there are the, the, junk the, jobs or yeah, there are horrible part-time jobs, yeah. and then there are the aristocratic rentiers. That's no, we, it. We there's actually, nobody in the middle. We actually have a very healthy bit in the middle, particularly in the Midlands. I mean, we are, we are tops in the world for engineering and all the rest. The Rolls Royce we factory. I'll give you that. You got one factory up there. They make great engines. Yeah, but the, well, the, other the, than that, where, where's the how did, how did the global uh, current account deficit get to six percent of GDP <laughs> if you have such a vibrant manufacturing base? That is a function in in essence of overspending by governments. I mean, once you work through the national accounts, that's how you get the twin deficits, if you like. So <clears throat> there are many different gold standards. Uh, which one is the best solution to our 
the global monetary problem. Because, okay, there are some people who are earning 80,000 pounds a year through their house, but there are many, many more who are unable to get on the housing property ladder, as it's called. More than 50% of the people living in London rent. They do not own a home. So, like, what is the best gold standard, and is there a new sort of form of gold standard in bit gold, the crypto gold standard? Well, when it comes to money, I'm afraid that changing the current system is a matter of crisis first, solution second. Yeah. We can come up with something that will work, but it's not going to be um, uh, introduced until there is a crisis. That, how about that Greece? Forces. Greece? Well, Greece is in a crisis. Uh, Could they introduce it now? And how would that improve the, the lot of the Greeks? Well, funnily enough, I mean, the Greek situation is interesting because uh, what nobody tells you is the number of euros, the amount of euros that are floating around in cash. Mm. Um, the idea that the Greek economy is absolutely sunk is completely wrong. Yes, it's very difficult. And it's nasty for pensioners and others who are relying on the government to uh, fund their day-to-day -day spending. Um, but basically, the economy could recover very, very quickly because there are all those euros in mm. circulation. Yes, they have without, more because of the, the run on the going banks. Going back to your point. Yeah, yeah, the run on the banks has been yes. going on for like eight months as they've exactly. been preparing for this. I mean, anybody who hadn't noticed it living in Athens must, have be, must be pretty dumb is all I can yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. So you know, people have prepared a lot more than you think. And the total amount of capital flight, as it were, uh, out of the system um, most of which I think is, is, is probably in the form of, 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 of cash rather than deposits, uh, totals around about 100 billion euros. I mean, this is... Wow. That's, that's and, like and we're talking about than, an economy of 100 of their, billion. Yeah, you know? yeah, going forward. If they default on all of their debt, they're kicked out of the euro or they leave the euro, how could they introduce a gold standard or a silver standard or a gold and silver standard or a well, bit gold standard? Well, the key to it is to understand that money is, as I say, stored labor. Mm -hmm. Now... If the situation was such that gold could be used as money, and what I mean is overcoming Gresham's law, because obviously mm. the, the rubbish money is going to circulate, the good money is going to get tucked away. But if one could overcome that, there is no reason why gold shouldn't operate properly as money. And people would be very, very happy, I think, to earn um, their wages in gold or a gold substitute and save it, spend it, whatever. And that way you would actually get um, a fairly stable, strong economy. History tells us that that is the result. I mean, the instability that we get in, 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 in uh, uh, any economy is as a result of printing credit and expanding the quantity of money. And the other thing don't forget is that one of the things that really does kill most people is inflation. Monetary inflation transfers wealth from the vast majority to the small minority. Okay, and that's so what, that's, that's, that, got, that stops, and that's a real Gresham's benefit. law, you said that also, how can big gold overcome Gresham's law? Well, it's, it's, it's a very interesting point, because um, bit gold now consists, really, or uh, gold money, consists of two separate functions. One is gold money's traditional function, and that is the storage of precious metals, uh, where gold money acts as custodians. It does not appear on gold money's balance sheet. Um, it is your property held for you in a vault of your choice. That's a traditional function. Where Bitgold comes in is that's a payment system. And what that does is, when you put money into your uh, Bitgold card, as it were, mm -hmm. because it works like a debit card, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, that money is immediately turned from whatever currency it is, whether it's Thai baht, US dollars, whatever, into gold, into physical mm. gold. When you draw down on it, it draws down out of gold. Mm. Now, here's something that's interesting. Recently, I was in France, and I was horrified to find that the cost of operating a bank debit card in France, denominated in sterling, is around about 4%. Bit gold is 1% in, 1% out. So it's actually a cheaper alternative. Huh. Now, the reason that this is likely to bring it forward is I think quite a lot of the people who, who use Bitgold probably don't think of it as money as such, but probably think of it more as an investment. So they may take the view that gold has fallen a long way and has probably got maybe a little more to fall, maybe not. But the point is that it's actually quite good value. So you can start using a debit card backed by gold for your normal transactions so that that is what brings gold out 
and defies Gresham's law. And so we're, I think we're, it, this is a very, very interesting story, and it's going to be fascinating to see how it develops. And I notice, incidentally, that the number of uh, cards uh, issued, debit cards issued, uh, increased by, it almost doubled in a month after they listed. So there is but a good globally, demand. Or where is globally, geogra globally. geographically, any hotspots? I, I don't know what the geographic breakdown is, but they're marketing into Asia through the Pacific just as much as they are this way. So Right, so it's a debit card that draws on gold, essentially. Yeah, that's backed by gold. Right. So your account is gold grams. It's not and dollars. And you can send $5 worth of gold anywhere in the world yeah. for virtually no money. Well, virtually you free. You don't send, you don't, well, you, you don't send gold, but what happens is you take your debit card and you go and spend it. And if, if let's say you're in Thailand, then it's Thai baht that you're spending. That, um, that's converted at the Thai bar uh, Okay, so it's a, a, a debit, into, you know, from it's a debit card against gold. Yeah, exactly but it's not that. a payment system in terms of used to have something at gold money, which was you could send gold electronically. Yeah, that, we, that became too difficult because um, uh, we found that around the world there were regulations that made it actually quite difficult okay, to so do. Okay, so this is just a pure debit card. So, so this, But exactly. as you point out, I mean, this then would put gold in your pocket and yes. you can spend it like any other cash. Yeah, and so what you could do is you could run your, um, uh, your main deposit account, gold deposit account, if we can call it that for the sake of argument, with gold money. It's a custody account rather than a bank deposit, certainly not that. Um, and uh, you could transfer gold from it into your debit card as and when you want to spend it. Mm -hmm. So it becomes, if you like, something which um, uh, only hits the banking system when the transaction is turned into currency. And then the last quick question here on the solutions uh, segment. Now, if you, you believe that a gold center would help, say, balance all this global trade imbalances and all that sort of stuff, but yeah. like, could one nation go it alone or one region, or does everybody have to do it? Because will Gresham's law destroy a nation if they are the only ones that go on a gold <laughs> standard? Uh, no, one nation can easily go on it. Um, and funnily enough, the one nation which I thought uh, had a very good case for going on, on it when uh, during the ruble crisis was, was Russia. Mm. I mean, there are conditions that you need to be able to fulfill. You mustn't be running a budget deficit. That's the first thing. Because otherwise you've got to, you know, you're getting Ended rid out. of gold. <laughs> exactly. Um, and you, you, you basically mustn't um, interfere in the underlying economy. Because people have to take their own decisions as to whether they're buying or selling things. So it's a complete shift from what we're used to. We're used to regulating absolutely everything from the shape of bananas to what you do when you get up in the morning. So, um, the, you know, the whole system we have at the moment in the West is, um, if you like, it's not apt. It, it's, not, it's, it's not useful. It, it can't really be adapted, if you like. It's rubbish. Standard. We're out of You've time. really We're got out to change time. the whole thing. We'll solve that problem. <laughs> Bit gold is my favorite solution. Yep. All right, well, stay tuned for the second half. A whole lot more. Они бегуны. С проверим. Сначала, я думаю, что они истинно такие люди, святые, можно сказать. А потом, когда узнал, у них в жизни всякое было. Когда это дело произошло, и было там, что у меня по мыслению идти в реку утопиться. Видишь, как 27 год не допросится никого. Для нас это была последняя попытка завести собственного ребенка. 
where the birth certificate will have the name of the genetic parents and not the surrogate. The surrogate has no right over the baby and has no duty towards the baby. It does seem like a meat factory. It looks as if we are going shopping and we are paying and we have an invoice and we have a baby. Crosstalk rules in effect, that means you can jump in anytime you want. Welcome to the second half of our Solutions Special on Money. Time now to turn to Ben Dyson of Positive Money, the man who got the Bank of England to admit that they create money out of thin air, correct? Not single-handedly, but... Right, the banks. The banks themselves create the money, and this is what we're going to talk about. We're talking about the positive money. What is it, and what solution does it offer to what problem? Well, so basically the big idea is, uh, well, the big problem is we've allowed banks to create most of the money in the economy. That has now, people, when you hear that, they think, oh, they print money, and that's what they do. But you're not, that's not what you're saying. You're saying no, they no, loan no. money uh, without any collateral behind it, and that then enters the economy as money, even though there's nothing behind it. It's just a, an accounting trick. That's it. 97% of the money that exists is created by banks when they make loans. So you, you walk into a bank to take out a loan. That money isn't coming from somebody's life savings. It's actually just created through a very simple accounting entry. Right, so when you say fractional reserve banking uh, against what you just said, what percentage is created this way, 97%? Yeah. Right, so it's not as if the banks are keeping 10% even of reserves on deposit. They are, from an accounting point of view, claim to have 3% on deposit, but then when you even dig down into those numbers, you find out that they have zero. Essentially, but go ahead. So, positive money is supposed to be a solution to this issue. Uh, what is the problem with this issue, and what is the Chicago School? How does it relate to positive money? Well, the, the problem is uh, that when you allow banks to create money, they, they create too much. They put most of it into speculation, property bubbles, mm. financial markets. Um, that led to the crisis of 2008. We're still paying for the cost of that. Now, the idea is that um, you should take the power to create money away from the banks. Let me jump in once again here, because in Iceland, they're going after bankers for counterfeiting money. In other words, the way that they describe what you're just talking about here is counterfeiting. So why don't we just say in the UK now, get rid of this idea of the nomenclature here that banks create money out of thin air. Because again, people will think that they're printing money and it's circulating in the, the economy. What you're saying, what Iceland has just used to arrest bankers and put them in jail is that they have figured out that bankers counterfeit money. So the Bank of England, HSBC, Barclays, Lloyds, Royal Bank of Scotland, they counterfeit money, correct? Well, you, you could say it that way. Legally, they'd argue that's not the case. But we don't care like, what they say because yeah. they're the crooks. If, I, if you go to the, and I rob a liquor store, and I ask the guy who robbed the liquor store, would you consider yourself a robber? Are you gonna not, I guarantee 100% of the time, the answer will be no, I am making a market in liquor, okay? We don't care what the crooks say, Ben. Do we? <laughs> we're not defined by the crooks, are we? Well, I mean, this is, this is what we're arguing. We need to get away from the current system. The, si the current system isn't working for the economy or for anybody else. Um, and that's why we're advocating this very different... So uh, what, what is the different thing? And f first, start with the Chicago plan. Chicago School, everybody knows Chicago School is very right-wing. What is, what is their role in creating this? Well, before the Chicago School was known as the Chicago School, back in the 30s, there were some economists that said, um, the Great Depression was caused by banks being able to create too much money. It's now time to move away from that system to one where 
um, control of money creation actually rests with, uh, with the state, with the government. Not necessarily with politicians, because they might go and abuse it, but with some kind of body that is working in the public interest rather than you know, chasing short-term profits. So say the Treasury or the exactly. central bank. Now, would it stop banks from lending or would it require them to, would they still lend towards property speculation? That seems like 85% of the loans in the UK banking system is for property speculation. Would that end or? Well, they, they'd still be able to lend, but they'd have to lend using money that they've actually got from savers. So they wouldn't be able to create all this additional new money. Counterfeiting money. If you want to put it like well, that. Well, I mean, but the truth is they're counterfeiting money. So the, what led to the crash of the, of the uh, market in the 29 period was that banks were counterfeiting money. The reason why there's been so much trouble uh, in the Eurozone is that Deutsche Bank and others counterfeit money. They're counterfeiters. That's yeah, what they well, do. They're the, counterfeiters. But the economic effect is the same as if you were printing. I know, but I think from a legal point of view, people need to understand that what you're fighting against counterfeiting. You're not fighting against uh, changing ideology, so whether it's the Chicago School, Milton Friedman, or the post-Chicago School. You're fighting against counterfeiters. And also, I watched one of your videos, and you talked about the fact that we essentially now in our system, we rent money from bankers. How much do we pay in the UK, for example, to rent money from bankers, and how would it look differently if we weren't renting it from bankers? Yeah, almost all of the money we're using has to be created by banks when they're lending. So we're paying interest on all of the money that exists, pretty much. Um, that What we end up paying for that is between, uh, depending on the interest rate at the time, it's between 160 billion, sometimes over 200 billion. And that's a transfer of income and wealth from everybody to the banks. And that's why they're so wealthy. Um, another thing that you were uh, linking to was a piece, an interview with Martin Wolf from the FT, where he said that banks are actually part of the state. And here's a guy from the Financial Times, again, like the Chicago School, not known for being like socialist or left wing or anything. He's saying that banks are part of the state. We have to accept that. They, they're never not going to be part of the state because the state requires monetary system. So he said, therefore, they're very, very highly paid civil servants. Now, if MPs voted for you know, a 20 million pound pay rise, the population would be up in arms, but they don't seem to care that these civil servants make that much. And they think it's, it's good, it's, they create wealth, they, they're, they're, if to, to, to be against it is to be jealous. All right, but the banks will tell you that they're competing. Yeah. And the Bank of England will say it's independent. Yes, so what the exactly. FT of the, Mar of the uh, Martin Wolf of the FT is saying is that there is no competition in the banking sector. They collude yep. with the Bank of England yep. to keep interest rates low, to make their cost of counterfeiting low. So what's the solution? Well, again, the, the solution is to change the nature of banking so that they can no longer create money. And that's, um, without getting into the technical details, that's not too difficult to do. Politically, it's difficult, obviously. But um, if you then transfer this power to create money back to the state, make sure that everybody can see how it's being used, make sure that the money is going into the real economy rather than the speculative economy. A lot of Londoners in particular, they make 80,000 pounds a year from their property prices going up. Would Londoners disagree with a system whereby they're not able to uh, live as rentiers? Well, there's, I mean, there's a lot of people who are bought into that system of, of just waiting for property prices to go up. But you've got to look at how unaffordable housing is now. These prices can't keep going up. They can be pushed up by newly created money, but the people living in those houses won't be able to pay the rent. And then you'll have another housing crisis, potentially another banking crisis. Ben, if the central bank can make interest rates, short-term rates move up and down, and we know that in the P2P lending market, the natural rate for, market for money right now for uh, borrowing and money is 5%. Mm. That's what the actual market is. What the Bank of England says is a half a percent. So yeah. they're, they're, again, not only are they counterfeiting, not only are they rentiers, but they're bald placed liars. So why can't uh, they simply say with their powers, whether the government, which is now we can, can say, as Martin Wolf has claimed, it's all part of the state. All the big four major banks, the Bank of England and the state, they're all part of the state. Why can't they simply just say, okay, as of tomorrow, every single property in the UK is going to be priced at 50% cheaper? There's a, a lot of politics. There's a lot of um, but they could, though. ideology. They could, though. They have the power to do that. Um, because they have the power to say what the price of money is. They have the power to say what the price of property is. To say that they have the power to do one and not the other, again, underlies the point that you have a clear case of fascism. Because it's a state, and the BBC, don't forget, is also part of the state, working against the interests of the 
population for the interest of um, an aristocratic rentier class of, of, of robber barons? Well, what we're saying is we need to get away from a system that's based on wealth extraction, you know, this rentier economy. But it's criminal, though. Why can't you just go, to why can't go to what Iceland did and say it's criminal? We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to prosecute you for counterfeiting and put that's you in jail. Because, well, that's because uh, in Iceland, all their property prices collapsed. And so the people themselves are no longer earning 80,000 pounds a year on uh, being rentiers themselves. So once they're losers in the system, then they're like, okay, let's end that system. Right now, everybody in London is a winner. Many, not so many people outside of London are winners. Again, how do we... How, what, what does it look like differently here? What would happen? Would the economy actually be stronger? Would people actually be earning more money? Would, uh, but their property prices would drop? Or what, what would happen? The, the big difference is that you would have money, instead of money being created as debt by banks, yeah. you would have money created debt-free, which is that nobody would have to borrow this money to get it into the economy. The state would be able to spend it into the economy. Mm. And, and what that is, it's like a source of, of uh, money that doesn't have this debt attached. And the government's current sort of recovery plan is basically for everybody to get into further debt so that it can run a surplus yes, and yes. pay down those debts. Yeah. Um, the way this sovereign money proposal that we're advocating changes things is it allows you to put new money into the economy without relying on you know, households to keep on taking on more debt. Okay, now leading up to so, World War I, there was a 100-year period where the global economy had the greatest wealth creation in history that was equitable globally with using debt-free money. That was called gold. I'd say a gold standard probably isn't flexible enough for the, the economy that we've got now. I mean, a lot of that growth and a lot of that progress you had because of the Industrial Revolution, because of technology, and actually a lot of the, the progress that we do have happens in spite of the Right, the Industrial the Revolution system. was the means of production. And it was very physical. You had labor, you had machines, and there was a gold standard. The means of production today is I push a button, I set off an algorithm, it scrapes billions of dollars off the global financial derivative market, and then I use that to buy my way into politicians and the BBC to totally corrupt this economy. Well, that's, so, that's not production. That's wealth extraction. No, that, but, but that's so, the means of production. That, that, that's, but so was wealth extraction. If you go back 100 years, factories and labor were manipulated for wealth extraction as well, according to the definition of those times. Now we're in the 2015, where this current means of production is algorithmic trading. So by not giving access to the population to this, either arrest them for counterfeiting or give everyone access to the same means of production. In other words, why, is people, why are people trying to get labor costs, their, their wages higher, when, when the money rate is the money rate is 20 times higher. It's stupid, you're, you're arguing, you're just shoveling sand against the ocean. Either have access to the means of production, that is to say you have algorithmic money creation yourself at home, I can push a button and make a million dollars appear in my refrigerator, like George Osborne does, essentially, or arrest me for counterfeiting. Those are your two options. There's, there's no, there's so no in, in between. The, in the last minute, how do we get to this situation? We only have a minute left. What is positive money? How would you get this situation where people give up a free life? We're, we're trying to get people to understand the way the system works until we understand how much of a mess it is. It's if I give a dog 40 to... pounds of dog food and I split open the, the dog food bag, they're going to eat themselves to death. It does, it I'm is... not going to incentivize that. You can't talk a dog off a meat wagon. I can't say, hey, dog, get off that meat wagon. So here you have millions of British people sitting on big, fat housing bubble thanks to counterfeiting cash, and you're saying, come off, come off the meat wagon, you Brits. They're not going to jump off the meat wagon. They're not going to oh. do it. you got to arrest the crooks. No? That's another approach. You could take that as well. Well, 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 also in counterfeiting or any crime like that, certainly in the United States, if you're benefiting from the proceeds of crime, even unwittingly, like in a Ponzi scheme, you have to give back those uh, those ill-gotten gains. So again, I guess you need some outside fo force to come in and and uh, take over it because uh, that's the only way to end this. Yeah, the global scheme. bond market crashes and then everyone's crying in their soup, and then the government will use that to extract and imprison people because they're complete and utter scum. All right, Ben Dyson, thanks for being on Solutions. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Well, that's it for this episode of Summer Solutions on the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Ben Dyson, of Positive Money. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Like Bye, y'all.